But when you have to learn it in order to teach it, man, you just got to really dig. You got to really dig and mine out those things. And it's been so good uh, over the last, I don't even know how long it's been now, several months now. Uh, through the book of Revelation. We have a ways to go, praise the Lord. And uh, it, wouldn't it be something if the Lord came back before we were done with the series on Revelation? Amen. That's okay with me. Amen. He's a lot better teacher than I am. Amen. And uh, we let the Lord teach us. Amen. And uh, But I've enjoyed this series through the book of Revelation. Now, we're going to use our Bibles tonight. We're going to go to the book of Joel. We're going to go to the book of Nahum. Uh, we're going to go over to the book of Isaiah, Ezekiel. We're going to be in Ezekiel as well. And so if you have never read the book of Nahum, uh, we'll be there in about 20 minutes. So I'll let you start now. And uh, within 20 minutes, you'll be, able to, you'll be able to be there. Now, I'm just teasing, but we will be in all those passages of Scripture. Well, Revelation chapter number 14, we'll begin reading in verse number 8 because we already uh, looked and studied through the first seven verses and really uh, the next several verses, but we're going to read down through the end of the chapter once again and uh, down through verse number 20 and then finish up this chapter tonight. The Bible says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now this is not a popular thing to say today, and I realize that, but I believe that the Catholic Church will have a big role to play in the tribulation. Not just the Catholic Church, but the Pope, I believe, will, will play a big role. I believe that the sitting Pope at that time, could be now, will probably be that false prophet that is mentioned there, that unholy trinity, and he will garner all the worship from the world, and if you think about it, really, you ever see the Pope hold out his ring, he holds it out like this, and you know what you do to the Pope's ring? What you gotta kiss the Pope's ring. Now, now, how many of you, if you ever saw the Pope, you would kiss the Pope's ring? Anybody? Or Tangia? Uh, amen. Nobody. Nobody would kiss the Pope's ring. Amen. But you know, there's a lot of people that would love that opportunity. Man, they would love the opportunity. I don't know if I would ever go in front of the Pope. I don't know what I would say. I might pull out a track and say, let me tell you something. Jesus loves you and he wants to save you. Amen. And, uh, and I don't want you to go to hell. Amen. The Pope needs to be saved as well. Amen. And I'll say that tonight. But uh, they will have a lot. The Catholic Church will have a lot to do with the tribulation. Now, I believe that the Pope will be uh, that false prophet. I know that's not popular. I could be wrong on that, but I believe as we study through here and get to Revelation uh, 17 and 18, we'll find out a little bit more about that. Uh, but I believe he will have that religious worship. We've already begun to see that. Over 500 world leaders basically ple pledged uh, their loyalty to the Pope. And did you know that there was even Christians, so-called so Christians, even Baptist preachers, isn't that a sad thing, uh, pledging their allegiance? Do you ever think that uh, a Muslim would bow down and kiss the Pope's ring? Uh, well, there will be a great ecumenical movement as it's already started. We see that all the religions coming together. Have you already seen that? And where are they headed? Back to the Catholic Church. Back to the Catholic Church. You've already seen that. And, uh, and there will be a great ecumenical movement and that false prophet very well could be the Pope at that time. And what will he do? He will say, everybody that worshiped me, I want you to worship someone else now. I want you to worship the Antichrist. And he will put all that worship. He said, I know you were worshiping me, but I want you to worship the Antichrist. Now, the Bible talks about Babylon here. And that is that worldly system of the tribulation of the Antichrist. But there will come a time when that system will be destroyed. Look at verse number 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, read the next word, if, yeah. if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in their forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that, two things. First of all, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. 
And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, save the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And I looked and behold, praise the Lord, I want you to look at it. I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. He that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. For her grapes, notice this thought, are fully ripe. You ever wondered what that might be? I want to talk to you about that tonight. You can underline that. Her grapes are fully ripe. The angel thrust in a sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God. The winepress was trodden without the city. Blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred Furlongs. Heavenly Father, we pray tonight, Lord Jesus, help us. Lord, as we open the precious Word of God, Lord, I'm thankful for our King James Bible that we have in our hands tonight. Thank you for the authority, Lord, that it is our sole authority. And Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that we're a Baptist tonight in a Baptist church, Lord. Thank you for it, Lord. We pray that you would bless this service, bless these good people on the day after Christmas, being faithful to you. Lord, everyone, Lord, probably here tonight could have been doing something else. But, Lord, we want to give priority and preeminence to the Word of God tonight. Lord, we pray that you would help us. We lift up the name of Jesus tonight. Lord, we pray that you would work in power in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we know there's great preaching today that takes place in the church age. We've heard about revivals. We've heard about God working. We've heard about Charles Spurgeon and George Whitfield. We've heard about Billy Sunday and Jack Hiles and Lester Roloff. And we've heard about these great men of yesteryear, the great revivals that have taken place during the church age. And can I say that the church age that we live in is coming to an end? Now, the end is almost here. Now, I'm not talking about the end of the world, but the end of the church age is upon us. I mean, I'm talking about almost at this very time. But did you know that great preaching will not end with the end of the church age? There will be great preaching that will continue and will go into the tribulation. Well, who are these great preachers? Well, first of all, there will be 144,000 sealed Jewish evangelists that will be preaching the gospel. Now, I want to tell you, we talked about those that can be saved and cannot be saved in the tribulation. If you're sitting here tonight and you've heard the gospel and you have and you've rejected the gospel and you say I do not choose Jesus, you walk into the tribulation and you're sitting here when the rapture takes place, you will not be able to be saved in the tribulation. I don't know how to make that any clearer than to say it crystal clear your faith will be sealed according to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And you can look at that verse there where the Bible says you had your chance to be saved, but you rejected Christ. And aren't you glad for a God that mixes judgment with mercy? And aren't you glad we're in a time of mercy right now? Aren't you glad that we can enjoy God's grace right now? But there'll be great preaching by those Jewish evangelists. There'll be great preaching also by Moses and Elijah. And think about the miracles that the Bible says that they will perform. And everyone will know that they're sent by God. In fact, they'll, have, they'll be hated. They'll be killed. They'll lay in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days. And according to the word of God, they will be resurrected in Revelation chapter number 11. And that will be that post-tribulation rapture of the saints. And they'll be taken out and they'll be taken to heaven. That's why God saved the body of Moses. God had a plan for the body Amen. of Moses. Amen. Why? He said, I'm, I'm going to use that body. Devil, you can't have that body. That body's not going to. I'm going to use that body, and he will in the tribulation. That time is coming. Amen. There was a battle over the body 
of Moses. Jude, verse number 9, talks about that. Well, the Bible says here, not only will there be preaching from the 144,000, those aren't Jehovah's Witness, by the way. Yeah. Amen. Help me out. Those are not Jehovah's Witness. Amen. No matter what they say. You ask them, you ask Jehovah's Witness, well, what tribe are you from? Yeah. Uh, amen. They're, they're, you know, uh, they're, they're not from a tribe. Amen. They're not part of 144,000. How silly that is. But Jewish evangelists, virgins, the Bible says, that we'd be preaching the gospel of Moses and Elijah. And then also, that third gospel witness will be that angel. And he will be crying in verse number 6. And he will be preaching the everlasting gospel. We talked about that. And they will, there will be great preaching during that time. There will be some that will be able to be saved. Of course, God's eye will turn from the Gentile, from the church. God's eye will turn back to Israel. Yeah. And God will deal, God will deal with his bride. That's right. Now that's Israel. Now Jesus has a bride. That's the church. Amen. Now Jesus is going, in, the bridegroom is coming back for the bride. That's the church. Then God will deal, God the Father will deal with his bride. That's Israel. That's for seven years during the tribulation. Now, verse number eight, the Bible says it makes this proclamation about the beast and his system. And notice that thought in verse uh, number nine, that if any person will worship the beast. What does that mean? Well, it means there's a choice to be made. Even in the tribulation, will you choose to take the mark of the beast, or will you endure, maybe be beheaded, be killed, and not take the mark of the beast? Now, that will ensure your salvation in the tribulation time. You say, well, what, how can someone be saved? Well, they can be saved by enduring until the end. By not taking, now listen, if you've heard the gospel in the church age, you, it won't matter. You'll, you'll believe a lie, the Bible says. You will be under strong delusion. But I'm talking about those people that have never heard. I'm talking about Israel. I'm talking about uh, the, those, those, those unbelieving Jews that their eyes will be open and they will have a choice to make as well. But if they decide to follow the beast, the Bible says their fate will be sealed, that they will be tormented. Now, it kind of does away with the idea of being annihilated. Now, Jehovah's Witness will tell you that you can be annihilated. What does that mean? That you cease to exist. That's not biblical. Right. Because the Bible says that these people will be annihilated, or they will be tormented with fire. In verse number 10, notice there, they will be tormented with fire, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I mean, there's no end to it. But notice that thought, and we said it, the drinking of the cup. What does that mean? Well, there's a lot of, uh, 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 of figurism here, and, and we see that in this verse where the Bible says there'll be a drinking that cup of indignation. And what is that? Well, it's without mixture, the Bible says. Now, what does that mean in verse number 10, which is poured out? The wrath of God, which is poured out, notice, without mixture in verse number 10. What does that mean? That means God's judgment. His absolute indignation will be poured out on this earth. Now, we don't know anything about that. I'm going to explain a little bit about it in a second. But you're talking about a terrible day. Yeah. A terrible day for those that are lost, for those that have rejected Christ, for those God-haters. It will be the worst day in human history. And I'm going to talk about it in just a second. But it will be poured out without mixture. What is that? There's no mixing of mercy. There will be no mercy. Now listen, today, there's a time of mercy. Did you know that? Today we have mercy. Today we have grace. But when God comes back, I want to tell you, at the end of the tribulation, when he comes back, it will be a time without mercy and without grace. Someone said, well, how, Pastor, how can a God of love permit his creation to suffer torment? Well, let me just say, God is not only a God of love, but God is holy. Right. And God in his holiness demands that there is justice along with love. <laughs> Amen. Why? Because God is perfect Amen. in everything that he does. We don't like the word torment, but it's in the Bible. Amen. I got a feeling that these people that started the Jehovah's Witness, the people that started Mormonism, all this thing, they looked at their Bible and they said, I don't like that. I don't like the idea of hell. 
Now, now you say, you, you think there's a lot behind Mormonism? You think there's a lot behind being a Jehovah's Witness? No, it's somebody that picked up a Bible one day and said, I don't like the idea of hell. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to change that. Since I don't want to change myself, I'm going to change the Bible. And what did they do? They took a verse out of Scripture and they birthed the whole religion. How scary that is. Yeah. That's why the Bible says to rightly divide the word of God. Yeah. God has repeatedly given chance after chance after chance to receive him and repent. All the way from the beginning, all the way to the end, God gives a chance. Now, I want to tell you, there's a major difference between saved and unsaved in verse number 11 and verse number 13. The Bible says in verse number 11, there will be those unsaved people that will have no rest. Notice that thought. Can you imagine? You, you know, now, we, don't, we can't comprehend. Our mind can com cannot comprehend the idea of no rest. Yeah. Those people that are tormented in fire, day and night, forever and ever, will have no rest. Amen? And then those in verse number 13, the Bible says they will have plenty of rest. Amen? Yea, the Spirit, and they may rest from their labors, the Bible says. There will be some, and I said it, there will be some who choose to reign with the Antichrist for seven years. I want you to consider that. I want you to think about that. They would rather rule and reign with the Antichrist for seven years and suffer in hell forever than to maybe suffer for seven years and rule and reign with Christ forever. Yeah. How could you make that decision? I mean, you're talking about a crazy idea. But there will be millions upon millions upon millions of people that decide to reject Christ. Now, here's what I believe in, and I believe I can show it from the Word of God. If someone goes to hell, here's how they go to hell. They must reject That's right. Jesus Christ. That's right. Every person will be given this gift. What are you going to do with this gift? Yep. Receive it or reject it. Right. Those that will go to hell will have to say this. I reject Jesus Christ. Yep. I'll do it myself. Right. There must be another way. I'll work my way to heaven. Those that receive him, well, they say, I'll take that gift freely. I'll put my trust in Jesus Christ. The harvest is right. In verse number 14 through verse number 20, the harvest is right. Now, what we have here in verse number 14 is we have an appearance of Jesus. Now, we're going to read down at verse number 20 where it describes the second coming of Jesus Christ. When he will step foot on this earth again. But the Bible says here we have an appearance in verse number 14 that is leading up to... The second coming of Jesus. You've heard there the battle hymn of the Republic. And let me just say, Julia Ward Howe, when she wrote the battle hymn of the Republic, she was a post-millennialist that believed that Jesus was coming back after the millennial reign. And let me just say, that's not true. And you can read that through scripture. And you must be we must be careful as we sing hymns and we sing songs to know that those songs are not inspired of God. There's only one thing that's inspired of God. That's the Bible. Right. Yes. Amen. That's why the Bible says speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Yep. I like those Bible songs. Amen. But I'm not trying to get you to lose faith in your songbook. I'm not trying to do that. But here's what I am saying. I'm saying you need to think. Mm -hmm. Amen. Not every song is doctrinally sound. Yeah. And I think a mature Christian will be able to say, hey, wait a second. That don't sound right. And the more that you grow in the Lord, the more that you'll be able to realize, such as, and I said it before, the song, The King is Coming for Me, is not biblical. Because if the King is coming for me, that means I'm going through the tribulation. Amen. I don't want the King to come for me. I want the bridegroom. And now, it's a great song. I love the song and I love the thought. And I guess you could turn it a little bit, but be careful about all those things. Those aren't inspired of God. Amen. But the word of God is inspired. We see here how the harvest is right. Now, we're going to take our Bibles and we're going to look at a, a couple of different passages. And I want you to be ready. First of all, look at Daniel chapter number 7. And keep your place in Revelation. We'll be right back here. All right. I'm going to turn just like you do to Daniel chapter number 7. And I actually just kind of flipped open, opened my Bible and it landed at Daniel chapter 7. <laughs> so, believe it or not. Um, but uh, I'm going to... Look at my Bible just like you do tonight, and when I get there, I'll begin reading. 
In Daniel chapter number 7 and verse number 13, the Bible says, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now I want you to look at verse 14. And there was given him dominion and glory and a what? And a kingdom. Now who do you think that's talking about? Well, if you're going to have a kingdom, there has to be a, a king. That's talking about Jesus. He's going to have a kingdom. A kingdom is going to be given that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So we see here a kingdom is going to be given. We're leading up to something tonight. Look back at Revelation chapter number 1. And then we're going to go over to the book of Joel. In just a minute. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 7. Now this is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Not at the rapture. Not at the rapture. Remember, not every eye is going to see him at the rapture. Not everybody's going to see him. But everybody's eye is going to see him at the second coming. When he steps foot back on this earth. In verse number 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. All kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. Look at verse 13. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Of course, that's in reference to the Lord Jesus. We see here, this is the final judgment of the world when Jesus comes back. Did you know that winning souls, back to Revelation 14, but winning souls is often referred to as a harvest. The Bible even says that the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are, are few. And pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest. So we're always praying, Lord, give us labors. There's a harvest to be reaped. The fields are white already to harvest. And Lord, and, and here's what we use. We use it for soul winning. And many times. But you know there's three different harvests the Bible talks about in the Bible. First of all, I want you to look at a couple of these here. But notice in Revelation chapter number 14 when the Bible says there, and we read it a little bit in verse number 18 at the end of the verse, for her grapes are fully ripe. I want you to ponder that thought and think about that. Look at Joel chapter number 3. Turn quickly, Joel chapter number 3 and verse number 13. Joel chapter 3 and verse number 13. Once again, a reference here to this very spot in history, or in the future, I should say, in the tribulation. Verse 13, the Bible says, put you in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Now, it's not talking about soul winning here. I want you to notice that. It's not talking about soul winning. Don't, don't, don't get mixed up. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow and then notice this. What is this? For their something. Their what? Wickedness. Their wickedness is great. You know, a grape, as it grows and as that matures, it reaches a level where it becomes ripe. Yeah. It becomes to the point where it ought to be plucked and it ought to be harvested. Talk about that just a little bit tonight. The scripture portrays this, but I look over at Matthew chapter number 21, and I want you to see, first of all, that God portrays Israel as a vineyard as well. In Matthew chapter number 21. Now we know that Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. God wanted to use Israel in a great way, but they rejected their Savior. Matthew 21 and verse number 33. The Bible says here another parable. There was a certain householder. Now you can mark that down and put underline householder and put that's God the Father. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. That vineyard is Israel. And hedged it around about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to the husbandman and went into a far country. Now when you see the word husband, you can just mark it down, down there, the religious crowd of the day. You can mark down the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious crowd of the day is the husbandman. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants. When you see the word servants in this parable, you can mark it down. That's the Old Testament prophets and those that God would send to try to turn Israel. The Bible says he sent his servants to the husbandman, 
That's the religious crowd of Israel. That they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen, that's the religious crowd, took his servants, the, old, the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants. God sent other servants. More than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, I got that underlined in my Bible, last of all. Last of all, he sent unto them who? His son. Who do you think that's talking about? That's Jesus. Saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, that's the religious crowd, that's the religious Pharisees, the religious scribes. When they saw the son, surely he will get reverence, right? They'll reverence Jesus. When they saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, notice this thought. What will he do unto those husbands? What will he do? That's what the passage here is talking about. Now, Israel was God's planted vineyard, but what happened? Well, they failed. The Bible says now in the church age, according to John chapter number 15, today Christ is the vine and we are the branches and we are in Christ. You ever think about in the tribulation how someone will be uh, intertwined with, uh, and I don't understand everything about this, but to be part of the Antichrist? In a way that today we are part of Christ, and the Bible says we are in Christ, praise the Lord, and those in the tribulation will make their loyalty to the Antichrist, and for some way will be part of him, and he will be part of them as well. And then someday in the tribulation, the world system is a vine, and, and here's what's happening. The world system, the iniquity, is becoming ripe for harvest. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Things are getting worse and worse. Now, my dad always used to say this. And what is that? You could say this. According to Scripture, things are getting riper and riper. What does that mean? We're not talking about soul winning. But we're talking about these grapes are getting ready to be reaped and to be harvested. And what is that? It's God's judgment. And it's getting ready to be poured out on this earth. And, poor, and it will be a terrible day. And what is it? You can just look at that. That grape is getting riper and riper and riper. And I want to tell you, that means this world is getting wick, more wicked and more wicked and more wicked until finally it gets to the point where it is fully ripe. And the, the Bible says that he will cast in the sickle and reap. Now, we, we don't like to think about these things because... This world and, and these TV evangelists have preached you that God is a God of love. Yeah. And God is a God that would never hurt anybody. But as, listen, my friend, as we read the word of God, we find out that there's another side of the coin. And that when God comes back, he's not coming as a servant. He's not coming as a lowly servant, as a carpenter. He's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming back in the fierceness of his wrath, the Bible says. And he will set things straight before he sits on his throne. Oh, you better believe that. He's going to set things straight. The Bible says back in Revelation chapter number 14, notice there in verse number 15. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 15. Another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap. Notice this, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. You know what that means? It's harvesting time. As things get more and more wicked, you, you know, last year, or earlier this year, we or last year, we were thinking about we wanted Donald Trump back in office. Well, let me just say, Donald Trump's not the savior of America. Amen. Let me just say that. He's not the Savior of America. Jesus is our hope. That's right. Amen. Not any politician. Amen. Now, what maybe what's best for our economy is Donald Trump, yes. yes. But as far as being the hope for America, as far as spiritually, it's not Donald Trump. Right. 
But we prayed, Lord, would you give us a little time of mercy here? And what did we say? Well, what we saw here is things are getting worse. And we look at it and we say, wow, what's going on here? What are we going to do? But what we're finding out is the grapes are ripening. Yes. Things are getting more and more ripe. Iniquity is abounding. You know what used to make us ashamed? What used to make us blush? No longer does. Yeah. We look at homosexuality. It used to be a word that we would hardly ever use. And we would look at it, what a wicked abomination. But we have become even, it's a moot point today. We have become to the point where we no longer look at it the way we ought to as an abomination. Amen. As wicked. Yeah. Rainbow flags abound on every side. Yeah. And what is that? Iniquity is abounding. Right. Transgenderism is abounding. Wickedness on every side is abounding. Iniquity is abounding. And it's going to come to a head where finally everything is ready to be reaped. And that's exactly what happens here. And we are leading up to that. Can't you see we're leading up to that point? And it will come to a head here, the Bible says. Now notice, it's time for thee to reap. Now Revelation 14 pictures the entire mass of unsaved religious people who will be stamped out. Until the blood is everywhere. And I say that literally. Until the blood is everywhere. Yep. Look at Isaiah chapter 63. Keep your place in Revelation 14. We'll be right back. Isaiah 63. And I want you to notice the first four verses. Isaiah 63. Notice the questions and the answers in the first four verses. The questions and the answers. First of all, the question. Who is he that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. That's the question. Who is this? Here's the answer. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to say. Here's the question. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? And thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat. And here's the answer. I have trodden the wine press alone. And of the people there was none for me. For I will tread them in my anger. Now we're getting there. But look at this. And trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. And I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. See the questions and the answers. Now back to Revelation chapter number 14. We see here that the Bible mentions this battle in verse number 20. And I want to set the stage for you just a little bit. But the, right, the wine press, the Bible says, was trodden without the city. When you see the word wine press, if you will. I just want to set it for you just a little bit. Let's look at a couple passages of scripture. Look overhead and keep your place here real quick. But look at Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel chapter 38. We're all turning together. Ezekiel 38. Look at verse number 21. Ezekiel 38 verse 21. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him. An overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Turn a couple pages over. Look at the book of Nahum and chapter number 1. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Chapter 1. And look at verse number 2. And notice here the same thought. God is jealous. Right. God is jealous. And the Bible says, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. You know, I want to tell all those 
preachers that preach the health, wealth, and prosperity and that God is only a God of love, I want them to read their Bible. I want them to read their Bible and, and, and for them to see in Nahum chapter number 1 exactly how the Lord comes back on his earth. The Bible says he's furious with great indignation. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds of the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and dryeth up all the rivers. Bash and languishes and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languishes. The mountains quake at him. The hills melt. The earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. And the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, but he knoweth them that trust in him. Now, can you imagine as we go back to Revelation chapter number 14? The Bible says that the winepress was crowded without the city. Can you imagine the time? And in the Old Testament, here's exactly what would happen. A Jew... Those people of the Old Testament, if they wanted to reap the harvest and they wanted to make that wine or grape juice, well, they would wait until the grapes were fully ripe. And they would make a spot, maybe a, a, a six foot in, in, in circumference there, circle of concrete. And they would begin to, rot, to, to to harvest the grapes and throw the grapes into this, uh, this little short wall there. And, and here's what they would do. They would get all the grapes in. And this concrete barrier around him, it would have just little spots where the juice would fall out. They would take off their, 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 their shoes. Take off their, what they had on their feet and they would wash their feet. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You know where I'm going with this. Don't be thinking about I love Lucy right now. All right? Do not think that I can see this Pat. This Pat, I know it's your birthday, so stop thinking like that. Miss Pat, I could tell where you were at. Anybody else thinking about that? Stop it. All right? Stop it. But here's this six-foot barrier. It's a concrete wall all around the grapes would be thrown in all over where the grapes were to the top. And they would get in, and you know where I'm going, and they would wash their feet. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Wash their feet. And, and, and what would they do? They'd step over the barrier. Now look, and what's happening to all the Jews? It's, yep. But who's, he's doing this, and, and guess where all the juice is getting up, all the, the grapes is getting up on him, yeah. isn't it? And he's stomping, stomping. You see that? <laughs> the wine press, and, the, and that's how they stomp the grapes. Yeah. That's how they stomp, they're stomping, 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 yeah. stomping, just like that in the wine press. Now, you know how they got the grape juice. You'll never drink grape juice in the same way again, will you? <laughs> now, you saw that. You saw this. You saw the grapes, right? They just... And, and, and really, he got... They would get all that grape juice all over. Well, notice verse 20. The wine press was trodden without the city. Now, about 82 miles from Jerusalem, there's a, the Jezreel Valley. It's called the Valley of Megiddo. Yep. And here's what's going to happen. Millions will be gathered in that valley against Israel. There will be gathered armies. There will be kings there. There will be great men. They're coming against Israel, coming to destroy them. But then here comes Jesus. Amen. I want to tell you, I love the figuratism here, but literally, take it literally. Because here comes Jesus. But 
it's not grape juice. What is it? Blood. And the blood is coming up. The blood is coming up. The blood. You say, man, I don't like that kind of religion. Well, then you don't like your Bible. Yeah. Look what the Bible says. The wine press was trodden without the city. And the blood came out of the wine press. I don't know for sure, but I've seen pictures of the Valley of Megiddo. And every now and then you'll see a gap in the mountains. And you can see at 175 miles, you can see this huge valley. Now, the Bible says, and listen, I, I think this is a part of Scripture that you can take literally. Mm -hmm. The Bible says the blood came out of the wine press even unto the horse bridles. The horse bridles. Now, I don't know about you, but how far is a horse bridle? Well, I mean, what are we talking about? Five and a half foot? Six, I mean, aren't we about right here? You say, what is that? That high? What is that? It's blood. Blood. I don't like that. Well, that's what the Bible says. That's right. What is it? It's the King of Kings and the Lord of His and the Lord of War. You say, "Oh, God's a God of love," but here's your God of love. That's right. That's your God of love. And he's stamping out millions. And the blood is up to the horse's bridle. Look at Revelation 19. The Bible says in verse number 11, here he comes. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Now listen, when I see Jesus in the air, mm -hmm. his eyes are not going to be eyes of fire because he's going to look at me as his son. Mm -hmm. I'm his child. Amen. The Bible says here, his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. A little bit different than the Antichrist in Revelation 6 where the Bible says he comes back as an imposter. And he has on one crown. Here comes Jesus. The Bible says he has many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture. Dipped in blood. Ooh. What? Dipped in blood. You might not like it, but it's in the Bible. Amen. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses. That's me and you. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. You want to get in that table? Amen. Can you ride a horse? If you yeah. can't ride a horse, <laughs> you'll be able to someday. Amen. Amen. Or cut, I, don't like, I don't like riding horses after my honeymoon. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like it. <laughs> the Bible says, And followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Amen. <laughs> And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and cried with a loud voice. Look at this. Saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, them that sat on him, the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Now listen, I don't know about you, but you can think what you want to about God. But what the Bible says is this is a time of mercy. But someday the mercy will be over. Will be done. We don't ever want to face that. 
But it's about time that some preachers stand up and say, God will not be merciful forever. Right. You better repent. Amen. You better get saved. Amen. Because someday, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, like a wine press, is going to step in and he will stamp out this world. And their blood will be up to the horse price. What a thought. What a thought. You can see that valley today, 82 miles from Jerusalem. Remember, the Bible says it's outside the city. And he will make his track from there. I'm looking forward to it. Amen. And he will march into Jerusalem. And he will break through that eastern gate that they got bricked off. That they got the cemetery in front of. He'll march through there and he will sit on the throne. Amen. Who will? Jesus. Jesus. What Jesus? The same one that went up. Amen. What Jesus? In the flesh? Oh, in the flesh. In the flesh. Amen. We'll be able to see him. Yes, in the flesh. Amen. He'll sit on the throne. Praise the Lord. I think we'll be able to see the, the holes in his hands. Amen. We'll be able to see the scars. We'll say, hey, that's Jesus. Praise the Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed tonight. I'm